My brother-in-law made a move on me, and when my husband defended me, my mother-in-law blamed me for breaking the family. Now I'm refusing to apologize. My name is Sarah, and I'm 31 years old. I've been married to my wonderful husband, John, for five years. We have two beautiful children, a three-year-old toddler and a 10-month-old baby. Our life, until recently, had been relatively peaceful and fulfilling. John works as a software engineer, and I stay at home to care for our children, a decision we made together and one that I've embraced wholeheartedly. About a year ago, John's brother Mark returned from living abroad with his wife and kids. At first I was excited about their return, thinking it would be great for the family to reconnect and for our children to bond with their cousins. However, from the very first family gathering after their return, something fell off. Mark made me uncomfortable in ways I couldn't quite articulate at first. He stared at me inappropriately, stood too close during conversations, and made suggestive comments about my appearance. I'm conventionally attractive and have a large chest, so I'm used to receiving unwanted attention. However, I always try to dress modestly and avoid excessive makeup to prevent drawing too much attention to myself. I believe that dressing up for special occasions like weddings or birthday parties and wearing a swimsuit at the beach is normal. I should have the right to feel comfortable and confident in my own skin without feeling like I'm inviting inappropriate behavior. Despite my discomfort, I didn't want to create any unnecessary drama, especially considering Mark had just reunited with the family. I tried to ignore his behavior, hoping it would stop. When Mark started sending me funny pictures and videos on Messenger, I didn't react much. On paper, it seemed like a normal thing for a brother-in-law to do. Still, it made me uneasy, and I decided to talk to John about it. John wasn't surprised when I raised my concerns. He acknowledged that his brother had always been a bit of a jerk and promised to speak with him. John's support was reassuring, but the situation didn't improve. We see Mark and his family at least once a month because they live with my in-laws, and every visit filled me with dread. The breaking point came during our last visit. Mark tried to touch my ass and John saw it happen. The ensuing conflict was explosive. John confronted Mark and things escalated quickly, leading to John pushing Mark before my father-in-law intervened and separated them. We left their house immediately, the atmosphere heavy with tension and unresolved anger. Not long after that incident, my mother-in-law visited me at home. I was alone with our toddler and baby when she arrived. She told me that my sister-in-law felt uncomfortable and blamed me for causing trouble within the family. According to her, Mark's behavior might have been a bit inappropriate, but their family had no problems before I came along. She claimed that Mark's marriage was now suffering, her sons were at odds, and everything was falling apart. She demanded that I apologize to my sister-in-law, refrain from attending family gatherings until things calmed down, and encourage John to reconcile with Mark. I felt blindsided and deeply hurt by her accusations. She even threatened that if I told John about our conversation, it would prove that I was enjoying the havoc in their family. Her words left me feeling isolated and confused. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't lie to John, and I didn't want our children to visit their grandparents without me. I felt unfairly for a situation that wasn't my fault. I believed I had the right to swim in a pool on a hot day and wear a one-piece swimsuit without being accused of causing trouble. I felt offended by my mother-in-law's claims and struggled to find a way to balance protecting my dignity, my family's well-being, and maintaining peace within the extended family. This is where my story begins, as I navigate the challenging dynamics of family conflict, personal boundaries, and the quest to protect my family from inappropriate behavior. Before Mark's return, my life was a blend of tranquility and fulfillment. John and I had built a solid foundation together over the five years of our marriage. We met through mutual friends, and our relationship quickly blossomed into a deep and meaningful partnership. John was my rock, supportive, loving, and reliable. We made a great team, sharing responsibilities and celebrating each other's successes. Our children brought immeasurable joy into our lives. Our three-year-old Emily was a bundle of energy and curiosity, always exploring and learning new things. Our 10-month-old Michael was just beginning to show his personality with bright eyes and an infectious smile. I took great pride in being a stay-at-home mom, ensuring our children grew up in a nurturing and loving environment. Every day was an adventure, filled with the small but significant moments that define parenthood. My confidence was something I had worked hard to build over the years. I knew I was conventionally attractive, and while this often led to unwanted attention, I had learned how to handle it gracefully. I dressed modestly, not because I felt the need to hide my body, but because I believed in dressing appropriately for the occasion. Whether I was at a social event, the grocery store, or the beach, I maintained a sense of dignity and self-respect. Before Mark's return, family gatherings were occasions I genuinely looked forward to. John's parents, Susan and Bill, had always been warm and welcoming. We often spent weekends at their house, enjoying barbecues, playing games, and watching the children interact with their grandparents. Susan was particularly fond of Emily and Michael, and seeing her dote on them always warmed my heart. 
John's younger sister Rachel and her husband were also regular attendees, and our interactions were always pleasant and supportive. Our family dynamics were harmonious and loving. Susan and Bill had a close-knit family, and they welcomed me with open arms from the beginning. They appreciated my efforts to maintain family traditions and values, and we shared many memorable moments together. I felt like a valued member of their family, and our interactions were characterized by mutual respect and affection. The peace and harmony of our family life made it easy for me to navigate any challenges that came our way. John and I communicated openly and effectively, resolving conflicts with empathy and understanding. We made decisions together, always prioritizing the well-being of our children and our relationship. Then Mark returned. His re-entry into the family dynamic brought an unexpected and unwelcome shift. Initially, I was optimistic about his return, hoping it would strengthen family bonds. However, from the very first family gathering he attended, I sensed something was off. Mark's behavior towards me was unsettling. He stared too long, made inappropriate comments about my appearance, and invaded my personal space in a way that felt invasive and creepy. At first I tried to brush it off, hoping it was just a phase or a misunderstanding. I didn't want to disrupt the especially since everyone was excited about Mark's return. But as time went on his behavior didn't improve. In fact, it became more intrusive. He started sending me messages on social media, sharing pictures and videos that made me uncomfortable. Although they were seemingly innocent, they felt wrong. Despite my discomfort, I didn't want to cause a scene. I confided in John, who assured me he would talk to Mark. John acknowledged that Mark had always been difficult, but he believed a conversation could set things straight. Unfortunately, the situation only escalated. Family gatherings, once a source of joy, became occasions I dreaded. The tension reached its peak when Mark crossed the line and tried to touch me inappropriately. John saw it happen and immediately confronted him. The confrontation was heated, leading to a physical altercation that Bill had to break up. We left in a hurry, the atmosphere charged with unresolved anger and hurt. My confidence, which had always been a strength, began to waver. The once harmonious family dynamics were shattered, and I felt isolated and blamed for a situation I didn't cause. Navigating this new reality required strength and resilience, qualities I had to rediscover within myself for the sake of my family and my own well-being. The discomfort began subtly, almost imperceptibly at first. The first family gathering after Mark's return was a welcome home barbecue at Susan and Bill's house. The sun was shining, the kids were playing in the yard, and the air was filled with the smell of grilled food and laughter. It should have been a perfect day, but I felt a strange undercurrent from the moment Mark walked in. During that barbecue, I noticed Mark's eyes lingering on me a little too long. At first, I brushed it off as my imagination, chalking it up to the fact that we hadn't seen each other in years. However, as the day progressed, his behavior became more apparent. He would stand uncomfortably close to me during conversations, making my skin crawl. He made several comments about my appearance, complimenting me in a way that felt less like admiration and more like objectification. Sarah, you haven't aged a day, he said, his eyes scanning me up and down. You look even better than I remember. I smiled politely, trying to deflect the compliment, but inside I felt uneasy. These comments continued over the next few gatherings. At a family dinner a couple of weeks later, Mark sat across from me at the table. I could feel his gaze on me throughout the meal, and every time I looked up, he was staring. It was unnerving. My discomfort grew with each encounter. At Emily's birthday party, Mark found reasons to be near me, brushing against me as he moved through the crowd, standing too close while we watched Emily blow out her candles. His comments became more suggestive. That dress looks amazing on you, Sarah, he whispered as he passed by, his eyes lingering on my chest. I tried to ignore him, focusing on the party and my daughter's happiness, but the tension was palpable. I began to dread family events, knowing that I would have to endure Mark's unsettling presence. Despite my efforts to stay polite and avoid confrontation, his behavior was starting to take a toll on my mental well-being. The final straw came during a family gathering at the beach. I wore a one-piece swimsuit, feeling a bit self-conscious about my post-pregnancy stretch marks, but wanting to enjoy the day with my family. Mark's behavior escalated. He made a point to comment on my swimsuit saying, you look great in that Sarah, really shows off your figure. His eyes roamed over my body and I felt exposed and violated. Throughout the day, Mark found reasons to be near me, whether it was helping with the children or joining conversations I was a part of. At one point, while we were all gathered around the grill, he stood so close behind me that I could feel his breath on my neck. My heart raced with anxiety and I quickly moved away, making an excuse to check on the kids. That night as we drove home, I couldn't hold it in any longer. John, I need to talk to you about Mark, I said, my voice trembling. John glanced at me, concerned in his eyes. What's wrong, Sarah? I took a deep breath and told him everything. How Mark's stares, comments and physical proximity made me feel uncomfortable and unsafe. 
I described the incidents in detail, hoping that John would understand the extent of the problem. John listened quietly, his expression growing more serious with each word. When I finished, he sighed deeply. Sarah, I'm so sorry you've been dealing with this. Mark's always been a bit of a jerk, but this is unacceptable. I'll talk to him. I felt a wave of relief mixed with apprehension. John's support meant the world to me, but I was worried about the fallout from confronting Mark. Nevertheless, I trusted John to handle the situation. I hoped that a conversation between the brothers would be enough to curb Mark's behavior. The next family gathering, I noticed a shift in the atmosphere. Mark was more subdued, his interactions with me less invasive. I dared to hope that John's talk had made an impact. However, the reprieve was short-lived. As the months went by, Mark's behavior slowly crept back to its previous levels of inappropriateness. At a dinner party hosted by John's parents, Mark resumed his habit of standing too close and making suggestive remarks. That color suits you, Sarah. Really brings out your eyes, he said, his tone dripping with innuendo. I felt my stomach churn with a mix of anger and fear. It was becoming clear that Mark had no intention of changing his behavior. Despite John's initial support, the situation didn't improve. Mark's actions continued to escalate, and I found myself constantly on edge, trying to avoid being alone with him. I confided in John again, expressing my frustration and fear. He reassured me that he would talk to Mark once more, but the lack of tangible change left me feeling helpless and vulnerable. The tension reached a boiling point at a family event where Mark attempted to touch me inappropriately. John witnessed the incident, and a heated confrontation ensued, culminating in John pushing Mark before their father intervened. The conflict was a stark reminder that Mark's behavior was not just a minor annoyance, but a serious violation of my boundaries and safety. As we left the event, the weight of the unresolved tension hung heavily in the air. I felt trapped in a cycle of discomfort and fear, unsure of how to protect myself and my family from Mark's predatory behavior. The once harmonious family gatherings had become a source of dread, and I knew that something had to change. The incident happened at a family barbecue, an event that should have been a joyous gathering filled with laughter and warmth. The sun was setting, casting a golden glow over the backyard as the smell of grilled food wafted through the air. I was helping Susan in the kitchen, preparing a salad when Mark walked in. His presence immediately set me on edge, but I tried to focus on the task at hand. As the evening progressed, I kept a careful distance from Mark, mindful of his previous behavior. I was standing near the grill, chatting with Rachel about Emily's latest antics, when I felt a hand on my lower back. I stiffened, hoping it was just an accidental brush. But then, the hand slid down and grabbed my ass. I spun around to see Mark, a smug grin on his face. I felt a surge of anger and disgust. What the hell do you think you're doing? I snapped, my voice shaking. John, who was just a few feet away, saw the whole thing. His eyes darkened with fury as he stormed over. What the fuck, Mark, he yelled, shoving his brother away from me. Keep your hands off my wife. Mark stumbled back, his grin quickly turning into a scowl. Oh, come on, John, it was just a joke. Don't be so uptight. John was livid. That wasn't a joke, Mark. That was assault. Stay the hell away from Sarah. The commotion drew the attention of the entire family. Susan and Bill rushed over, trying to calm their sons. What's going on here, Bill demanded, looking between John and Mark. John pointed at Mark his voice trembling with rage. He grabbed Sarah. He's been making her uncomfortable for months, and now he's crossed the line. Susan looked horrified, while Bill's expression turned stern. Is this true, Mark? Mark shrugged, trying to play it off. It was nothing. Sarah's overreacting. I felt tears well up in my eyes. The sense of violation was overwhelming. I had endured his inappropriate behavior for so long, and now he had escalated to physical assault. The shock and anger coursed through me, mingling with a deep sense of betrayal. This was supposed to be my family, too. A place where I felt safe and loved. John's support was unwavering. He wrapped an arm around me protectively, his voice softening as he spoke to me. Are you okay, Sarah? I nodded, though my hands were still shaking. I'm fine. Just. Let's go home. We left the barbecue in a tense silence, the atmosphere heavy with unresolved anger. As we drove home, I couldn't hold back the tears any longer. I can't believe he did that, I whispered, my voice breaking. John reached over and squeezed my hand. I'm so sorry, Sarah. I should have done more to stop this sooner. I'll make sure he never touches you again. The emotional impact of the incident hit me hard. I felt violated and exposed. My sense of security shattered. The backyard, once a place of happy family memories, now felt tainted by Mark's actions. The physical sensation of his hand on my body lingered, a constant reminder of his disrespect and entitlement. Over the next few days, the tension within the family escalated. Mark's behavior was the topic of heated discussions, with opinions divided. Some family members, like Rachel and her husband, expressed their support for John and me, condemning Mark's actions. Others, including Susan and Bill, 
seemed more concerned about the rift forming between their sons. Susan visited me a few days after the incident. Her face lined with worry. Sarah, I know what Mark did was wrong, but he's still my son. This conflict is tearing our family apart. Can't we find a way to move past this? Her words stung. It felt like my feelings and safety were being weighed against the desire to maintain family harmony. I don't know Susan. What he did was unforgivable. I can't just pretend it didn't happen. The sense of violation lingered, affecting my interactions with the entire family. I felt exposed and vulnerable, constantly on edge during family gatherings. The trust one had once placed in this extended family was eroded, replaced by a wary caution. Despite the support from John and a few others, the incident left a lasting scar. It was a painful reminder of the boundaries that had been crossed and the respect that had been violated. The emotional impact was profound, but it also fueled my determination to protect myself and my family from further harm. I knew that the road to healing and resolution would be long and fraught with challenges, but I was ready to face it head-on with John by my side. A few days after the incident, my mother-in-law Susan came over to our house. I was at home with Emily and Michael, trying to keep the kids entertained while processing the turmoil from the barbecue. When Susan knocked on the door, I felt a pang of anxiety. Her unexpected visit was rarely a good sign, especially given the recent tension. Hi Susan, I greeted her, trying to keep my tone neutral. Come in. Susan walked in, her expression a mix of concern and determination. She glanced at the kids playing in the living room before turning her attention to me. Sarah, we need to talk, she said her voice serious. I led her to the kitchen, offering her a seat at the table. What's this about, I asked, though I had a sinking feeling I already knew. Susan took a deep breath. It's about what happened at the barbecue in the aftermath. Rachel has been feeling very uncomfortable since then. I blinked, taken aback. Rachel, what does she have to do with this? She's feeling caught in the middle, Susan explained. She's upset about the conflict between Mark and John, and it's affecting her relationship with Mark. My frustration began to bubble up. Susan, with all due respect, Rachel's discomfort isn't the main issue here. Mark crossed a serious boundary. He assaulted me. Susan nodded slowly, but her expression remained firm. I understand that Sarah, and I'm not excusing his behavior, but the way things are escalating is tearing this family apart. Mark's marriage is suffering, and my sons are at each other's throats. We had no problems before you came along. Her words hit me like a punch to the gut. So you're saying this is my fault? Susan sighed. I'm not blaming you entirely, but your presence and the way things have been handled are contributing to the discord. I spoke with Rachel, and she feels that you might be overreacting. Maybe Mark was being a bit inappropriate, but she thinks you should try to find a way to move past it for the sake of the family. Anger flared up inside me. Susan, how can you expect me to move past something like that? Mark didn't just make an inappropriate comment. He physically touched me without my consent. That's not something I can just brush off. Susan's expression hardened. I'm asking you to consider the bigger picture, Sarah. We need to restore harmony in the family. I want you to apologize to Rachel for making her uncomfortable and to refrain from attending family gatherings for a while. Let things calm down. I stared at her in disbelief. You want me to apologize? For what? For being the victim of your son's inappropriate behavior? Susan reached out, placing a hand on mine. Sarah, I know this is difficult, but we need to find a way to keep the peace. Encourage John to make up with Mark. We can't have this tearing the family apart. I pulled my hand away, feeling a mix of anger and betrayal. Susan, this isn't about keeping the peace. This is about you wanting to sweep Mark's behavior under the rug and blame me for the fallout. I won't apologize for something that isn't my fault. Susan's eyes narrowed slightly. This conversation is between us women, Sarah. If you tell John about it, it will only prove that you're enjoying the chaos you're causing. Think about what's best for the family. With that, she stood up and walked towards the door. I followed her, my mind racing with anger and disbelief. Susan, you're asking me to lie to my husband and accept responsibility for something I didn't do. How can you think that's fair? She paused at the door, turning to face me. Sometimes we have to make sacrifices for the greater good. I hope you'll think about that. As Susan left, I felt a storm of emotions brewing inside me. I was furious at her unfair accusations and demands. The idea of apologizing for being a victim was abhorrent, and the suggestion to avoid family gatherings felt like punishment for Mark's behavior. But beyond the anger, there was a deep sense of sadness and betrayal. I had always tried to be a good daughter-in-law, to fit in and contribute to the family. Now, I was being scapegoated for the actions of someone else. The thought of keeping this conversation from John felt wrong, but Susan's threat lingered in my mind. I knew I had to tell John. He deserved to know what his mother had said and what she was asking of me. The decision to stand up for myself and maintain my integrity was not just about me, it was about protecting my children and ensuring that they grew up in an environment where respect and honesty were paramount. With a heavy heart, I resolved to have a candid conversation with John that evening. I couldn't let this family discord compromise my principles 
or my sense of self-worth. Together, we would find a way to navigate this difficult situation, supporting each other and standing up against the unfair expectations placed upon us. After Susan left, I sat at the kitchen table, my mind swirling with a tumult of emotions. The conversation had left me feeling deeply conflicted. Her demands seemed unreasonable and unjust, but they were also accompanied by a threat that made my stomach churn. If I didn't comply, I would be seen as the source of the family discord, and Susan would make sure that John thought I was enjoying the chaos. The thought of lying to John felt like a betrayal of the trust and honesty that were the bedrock of our marriage. We had always been open with each other, sharing our fears, frustrations, and dreams. Keeping Susan's conversation a secret felt fundamentally wrong. Yet I couldn't ignore the potential fallout if I defied her. The idea of being blamed for tearing the family apart weighed heavily on my mind. I looked over at Emily and Michael, playing innocently in the living room. My protective instincts surged. As a mother, my primary responsibility was to ensure their safety and well-being. Mark's behavior posed a direct threat to that. Avoiding family gatherings might keep them away from his inappropriate actions, but it also meant isolating myself and my children from the rest of the family. They deserved to have a relationship with their grandparents, but not at the cost of their safety or my peace of mind. As I reflected on the situation, I couldn't help but think about my self-worth. Allowing Mark's actions to go unchallenged would mean accepting disrespect and violation as part of my life. It would mean prioritizing family harmony over my own dignity and safety. I had worked hard to build my confidence and self-respect, and I wasn't willing to sacrifice that for the sake of avoiding conflict. The internal conflict was agonizing. On one hand, I wanted to protect my children and maintain some semblance of family peace. On the other hand, I couldn't stomach the idea of apologizing for being a victim or encouraging John to make up with Mark. The very thought made me feel sick. I deserved to feel safe and respected, and so did my children. I replayed Susan's words in my mind, trying to find a way to navigate the situation without compromising my values. She wanted me to apologize to Rachel and stay away from family gatherings. She also expected me to persuade John to reconcile with Mark. All of these demands felt like a betrayal of myself and the principles I held dear. The more I thought about it, the clearer it became that complying with Susan's demands would not solve the underlying issues. It would only enable Mark's behavior and undermine my sense of self-worth. I needed to stand up for myself, for my children, and for what was right. I couldn't allow fear and manipulation to dictate my actions. Finally, I decided to have an honest conversation with John. I needed his support and understanding to navigate this difficult situation. Together, we could find a way to protect our family without sacrificing our principles. I took a deep breath and resolved to speak with him as soon as he got home. When John walked in that evening, I could see the exhaustion in his eyes. He had been dealing with the aftermath of the confrontation with Mark, and I knew this conversation wouldn't be easy. But it was necessary. I had to trust that our relationship was strong enough to withstand this challenge. John, we need to talk, I said softly, leading him to the living room. I took a deep breath and recounted the conversation with Susan, sparing no detail. I watched his face change from confusion to anger, and finally to a look of grim determination. She had no right to ask that of you, John said, his voice firm. You did nothing wrong, Sarah. Mark's behavior is the problem, not you. I felt a surge of relief at his words. I can't apologize for something I didn't do, John. And I can't lie to you or avoid family gatherings just to keep the peace. John nodded. We'll face this together. I'll talk to my parents again and make it clear that we won't tolerate Mark's behavior or any attempts to blame you for his actions. In that moment, I felt a renewed sense of strength and resolve. We were a team and together we would protect our family and stand up for what was right. The path ahead wouldn't be easy, but I knew we could navigate it with honesty, courage, and mutual support. With our resolve to stand up for ourselves and protect our family firmly in place, John and I devised a plan to address the situation head-on. We knew it wouldn't be easy, but it was necessary to ensure our safety and well-being. First, John arranged a meeting with his parents, Susan and Bill. We decided to speak with them together, presenting a united front. When we arrived at their home, the tension was palpable. Susan looked anxious, while Bill seemed resigned to the conversation. John and I sat down with them, and he began. Mom, Dad, we need to talk about what happened with Mark and the expectations you placed on Sarah, John started, his voice calm but firm. Susan sighed, but John continued before she could interject. Mark's behavior is unacceptable. He crossed a line and we won't tolerate it. Sarah did nothing wrong, and it's unfair to blame her for the family's discord. Bill nodded slowly. We understand that Mark's actions were inappropriate, but this conflict is tearing the family apart. I took a deep breath and spoke up. We want to maintain a relationship with the family, but we need to set some boundaries to ensure everyone's safety and comfort. We can't ignore what happened, and we can't pretend everything is fine. Susan looked conflicted but nodded. What do you suggest? We suggest that Mark not attend family gatherings for a while, John said. 
This will give everyone time to cool down and address the underlying issues. Additionally, if he does attend in the future, we need clear boundaries in place to ensure he behaves appropriately. Bill looked thoughtful. That seems reasonable. We'll talk to Mark and make it clear that his behavior won't be tolerated. With that part of the plan in motion, John and I reached out to Rachel and her husband. We invited them over to discuss the situation, hoping to clear the air and find common ground. Rachel arrived, looking wary but willing to listen. Rachel, we understand that this situation has been difficult for you, I began. But it's important to us that you know the full story. Mark's behavior has made me feel unsafe and uncomfortable, and we need to address it. Rachel nodded slowly. I didn't realize it was that bad, Sarah. I'm sorry if I seemed unsupportive. We appreciate that, Rachel, John said. We just want to ensure that everyone understands the seriousness of the situation and supports the necessary boundaries. Rachel agreed to speak with Mark as well, reinforcing the message that his behavior was unacceptable and he needed to change. It was a relief to have her support, and it felt like a step in the right direction. To ensure a safe environment for our children, John and I decided that family gatherings would now take place at our home, where we had more control over the situation. We also established a clear set of rules. Mark would not be invited until he demonstrated genuine change and respect for boundaries. These gatherings would be smaller and more manageable, allowing us to maintain relationships without compromising our safety. John and I also took steps to protect our emotional well-being. We sought counseling to help us navigate the stress and anxiety caused by the situation. The therapist provided valuable insights and coping strategies, helping us to communicate effectively and support each other through this challenging time. We also made a point to spend quality time together as a family, creating positive memories and reinforcing our bond. Whether it was a simple outing to the park, a movie night at home, or a weekend getaway, these moments helped us to reconnect and find joy amidst the turmoil. As the weeks passed, we saw gradual improvements. Susan and Bill respected our boundaries, and Rachel's support helped to ease the tension. While Mark's behavior hadn't changed overnight, the steps we took ensured that our family felt safer and more united. Taking action to protect our family required strength, courage, and unwavering support from each other. It wasn't easy, but it was necessary. Through open communication, setting clear boundaries, and prioritizing our well-being, we were able to navigate the difficult situation and create a safer, healthier environment for ourselves and our children. Over time, the conflict with Mark reached a resolution. With clear boundaries set and the support of John, Susan, and Bill, Mark was held accountable for his actions. He eventually apologized and agreed to counseling to address his behavior. While it would take time to rebuild trust, the immediate threat was mitigated, allowing the family to start healing. The dynamics within the family shifted significantly. Susan and Bill, initially resistant, came to understand the importance of creating a safe environment for everyone. Rachel and her husband remained supportive, fostering a sense of unity and understanding. For me, the experience was transformative. Standing up to Mark and setting firm boundaries reinforced my sense of self-worth and security. I realized the importance of advocating for myself and protecting my family, even in the face of familial pressure. Reflecting on the journey, I understood the critical importance of addressing inappropriate behavior head-on. It wasn't just about my own safety, but also about setting a precedent for respect and accountability within the family. Moving forward, I am hopeful for a positive future, confident in our ability to maintain healthy, respectful relationships, and provide a nurturing environment for our children.